This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Monday, September 14th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, Tropical Storm Sally strengthens in the eastern Gulf of Mexico as it inches towards the Mississippi coast. Then hundreds line up for meals as the economic toll of the coronavirus pandemic lingers. Plus, a virtual conference aims to equip caregivers with the tools to manage Alzheimer's. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Tropical Storm Sally is moving slowly northwest toward the mouth of the Mississippi River as it continues to gain strength, now with sustained winds of 65 miles per hour. Some residents of Hancock County are currently under an evacuation order. Local emergency agencies are warning storm surge and power outages could occur as early as tonight. For the latest on Sally and the threat it presents to Mississippi, we're joined by Benjamin Schott of the National Weather Service in Slidell. Good morning, Benjamin. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. We're going to get right to it. What is the current situation with Sally? Where is the storm? What is the strength of the storm? storm? That kind of information? Sure. Uh, currently, right now, it, it's still a, a very high end tropical storm. Uh, it's showing signs uh, right now of uh, starting to intensify. Uh, I would not be surprised if it, it's not defined as a uh, hurricane with this uh, possible intensification that we're seeing right now. Uh, sometime later on this morning. Uh, right now it's centered uh, basically due south almost of uh, Pensacola, Florida, and it has a very slow drift uh, to the west, um, uh, and that will probably continue on through most of the day today. I noticed that the storm has slowed down. We're now at 7 miles per hour, I believe. Does that p- present a better chance that it will strengthen? Are we sure it's going to be a Category 1 hurricane? I would say uh, that Category 1 is, is probably a pretty solid forecast at this time. Uh, the Gulf is, is very warm, uh, so there's uh, plenty of fuel for the storm to continue to intensify uh, as it uh, drifts uh, during the day-to-day. Um, you know, for us, the number one thing that we're going to watch is how far west it, it can drift. Uh, the hurricane hunters are in it right now. There are some signs that maybe the center was a little bit further south than what they thought, um, and the implications of that are that it could – actually move a little bit more now to the west. Uh, We'll get a better take on that as uh, they continue to fly the storm uh, through this early portion of the morning. Has anything changed in terms of when it will arrive? Because yesterday we were hearing that the storm surge would come with high tide and how that presented a, a, a more dire situation for Mississippi. Yeah, so the surge will start to uh, uh, develop today, uh, actually, with the storm now really not that far off uh, the coastline. Um, it, it will continue to, uh, to slowly start to work its way up. Obviously, the peak of it will be as it makes landfall uh, tomorrow. But, um, but right now, um, you know, there'll, there'll be an increase of the water along the coast as we start to get more of that, that easterly uh, flow as the storm works its way towards the area uh, during the next 24 hours. At 7 to 11 feet of storm surge, is that still the case? Yeah, so it's very likely uh, that, you know, areas like Bay St. Louis, uh, Gulfport, Biloxi, you know, all those areas are, are definitely in that range. And then as you get further over towards Pascagoula, you know, 5 to 8 feet of surge are, are, are definitely possible. So uh, for anyone with any interest to log right along the coast, understand that, uh, uh, you know, a wall of water coming in, and, and those are, those folks, you know, experience this multiple times. Um, you know, that's almost as high as a one-story building. So, uh, you know, folks need to take this seriously along the coast and understand that surge um, can uh, put people at risk if you're not prepared. Benjamin, I know that as the storm moves inland, it's presenting challenges for other areas of southeast Mississippi in terms of rainfall. Can you talk about that a little? Sure. So the interesting thing with this storm is it has uh, an immense amount of uh, moisture in it, uh, like most storms do. But 
the the other part of this is is again that speed that movement is what's going to make this uh devastating when it comes possibly to the rainfall amount um i won't be surprised uh if this track holds what we're seeing right now and it moves somewhere around the mouth of mississippi up towards uh the coast of mississippi there will be places uh, along the coast and in southeast mississippi that will be measuring rain somewhere probably you know greater than 20 inches um, and there's some of the models that show uh, amounts even possible as high as 30 because this storm is moving so slow, you're going to have such an extended period of heavy rain possible. How many days or how many hours are we talking about where Mississippi is going to be affected by the storm? Well, again, the speed is, is so painstakingly slow. Um, you know, the rain will have started uh, sometime uh, this evening with the outer bands starting to work their way in. Uh, and then the heaviest rainfall will be uh, the entire day on Tuesday. I mean, it's possible that it goes from the mouth of the Mississippi to the Mississippi coastline, uh, and that's 24 hours. So, I mean, it's not a very uh, large area. It's moving so slow at that point, and it doesn't start to exit into Alabama until we get into the early hours on Thursday. So, as you can see, there's uh, really a, a 36- or 48-hour window where the possibility of heavy rain bands are moving across the area uh, you know, it just enhances the threat when it comes to, uh, to flooding and uh, issues in, involving water. Often the risk of tornadoes is heightened during a hurricane. What is that situation? So they're definitely possible. It's something that we see uh, with most landfalling uh, tropical systems. Um, that threat is there. Uh, I would say it's, it's not the highest threat. Um, obviously, uh, I think this, the rainfall and the flooding um, that, that's the one, this water that ends up being the number one killer. Uh, a lot of folks uh, look at the, uh, some of the other threats and they, and they get focused on the wind speed and things, and there'll probably be power outages and there'll be issues there. Um, if I could just pass along the message, I think it's, it's respect the water part of it, respect the surge, uh, respect that there's going to be um, an amazing amount of rainfall, and, uh, and that's going to put some very serious situations out there if anyone's trying to travel at all. I uh, highly recommend people do not try to drive uh, it, when it starts to rain and in the heart of the storm, you're putting your life at risk. Well, certainly all of Mississippi or a great part of Mississippi is going to be affected and we're in for the long haul. And Benjamin Schott of the National Weather Service in Slidell, I thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mississippi Emergency Management Agency and National Guard are preparing for Sally and the severe threat of flooding it brings. MEMA Director Greg Michelle says the combinations of storm surge and flooding could impact Hancock and Pearl River counties. The high risk of flash flooding, uh, particularly in Hancock and Pearl River County that are projected to get 15 plus inches of rain, that's a lot of rain. It's a lot of rain uh, working against a storm surge. So if you live along the coastal counties in these areas and even as far Uh, to the east is Jackson County can expect storm surge uh, and rain as well, but the concentration of that rain is pretty much going to be there in the Hancock County and Pearl River County. This storm system, because it's going to move slow, is probably going to persist over most portions of the state for uh, basically 48 hours. So a lot of rain going to be dumped in the state of Mississippi. Local emergency management agencies are handing out sandbags and MEMA is providing an additional 100,000 bags to help residents protect their property. A mandatory evacuation order is ha, or has been issued is in effect now for parts of Hancock County. Governor Tate Reeves is encouraging other residents in high danger areas to evacuate now. The people in Hancock and Pearl River and Harrison and Jackson counties that live in low-lying areas, um, this is not news to them. They are aware that they live in low-lying areas, and whether it is made mandatory, which is very possible early tomorrow in each of these counties that you, uh, that you do leave low-lying areas or not, uh, I am telling you it is, it is very likely that we're going to get significant amounts of rainfall. It is very likely that the landfall of the eye of the hurricane Uh, Regardless of where it hits, it's very likely that it's going to hit at a time in which there is high tide, and so uh, the which is we would expect nothing less in 2020, right? Um, But it is certainly um, uh, it needs to be understood by all of our friends in in the coastal region and in South Mississippi that if you live in low lying areas, uh, do not try to get out at three or four o'clock in the morning on Monday night or Tuesday morning because at that point. Uh, it's going to be too late. 
State officials say they're aware of how quickly the forecast from Hurricane Laura changed last month. Reeves says the state is preparing for the worst. We are very confident that we are this, uh, the east side of this storm is going to hit Mississippi. Uh, but we'll, we'll, as we get closer and closer, get even better uh, information. Uh, but our job, as it always is in these storms, is to prepare for the worst case scenario, to pray for the best case scenario, and expect somewhere in between. And our emergency management personnel at the state level certainly are very capable, very competent, and that is true at the local level as well. Uh, and there are, there are none more uh, capable and competent than our members of our Mississippi National Guard. Reeves says public shelters will be made available, but the coronavirus pandemic does complicate things. Clearly, COVID-19 complicates sheltering. Uh, we have been saying that uh, ever since the uh, third largest tornado in American history hit Mississippi back on Easter Sunday. Uh, sheltering is more complicated uh, because of COVID-19. Um, and so uh, we strongly encourage those who can to shelter uh, at a neighbor's house or at a friend's place or at someone, uh, a loved one's house or, or a place of residence. Uh, and not use the public shelters. But we will have public shelters uh, open and available if necessary. MEMA Director Greg Michelle says preparations for response to Sally are already underway, and his agency is coordinating with the National Guard to provide timely relief and assistance. But we have leaned forward a little bit more than we normally would with a storm like this because we are concerned about the flash flooding. So we've got additional high water vehicles that have been staged, um, in the vicinity, either with Camp Shelby or at CRTC. Uh, we also have got an IMAT team from FEMA that are going to be integrated with us throughout this uh, period of time. We've already made preparation with sandbags uh, to the counties. Uh, shelter operations, shelter operations uh, being prepared for right now. Uh, the evacuations in those counties will be handled at the county level. And then based on when and where they evacuate citizens, then uh, shelters will be made available uh, at that time. But final comment, do not take this storm for granted. A lot can happen. This storm could get much, uh, could become greater than a Category 1. Reminder to you what happened with Laura. That storm was not forecast to be anything greater than a Cat 2. It came ashore as a Cat 4. Very devastating storm. So stay alert. Uh, pay attention to the uh, uh, directions that come out of your emergency management personnel over the next 24, 48 hours. Coming up, hundreds line up for meals as the economic toll of the coronavirus pandemic lingers. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. The number of people going hungry in Mississippi has increased during the coronavirus pandemic. As MPB's Kobe Vance reports, Mississippi leads the nation in food insecurity. Hundreds of cars are wrapped around the state fairgrounds in Jackson with people waiting to receive free boxes of food. It's hard to find stuff you need, essentials, you know. It's, it's crazy. The first time I walked in Walmart and the shelves were empty, I cried. Pam Roberts, along with her friend Aletha, have been waiting in line for hours to receive a week's worth of meals. Both are out of work because of the pandemic and are relying on free food assistance. And what we do when we get it, we, we dump it all out and we get what we want and then we fix up for other people that we know that couldn't have make a ride it yeah. or some older people. Yeah. We try to share. We love to help others. Included in the meal boxes are things like chicken, eggs, and milk, all sourced from Mississippi farmers. Rosie Ryan of Byram is also waiting in line for her box of food. She's out of work, and her kids are distance learning from home and can no longer rely on school meals. This is going to last a whole week. That'll be, that'll be wonderful, good. You know, like I say, children at home every day, got to have three meals. You know, this will help out a lot because I'm not working right now, so I'm not working. Uh, what did you do before the pandemic? Oh, I was a hairstylist, but I got health problems, diabetes, sickle cell, and stuff like that. And I'm scared of this stuff. 1,400 family-sized boxes are being handed out as part of the USDA's Farmers to Families Food Box program. Mississippi Agriculture Commissioner Andy Gibson 
says the program not only benefits farmers, but families who are impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. There are families who have been impacted so severely by this virus with the loss of jobs, of income. A lot of people who are still looking for work don't have work. So this is directly uh, responsive to helping people in need at the same time as it's filling that gap in the the supply chain that had existed in the spring and early summer of this year. According to Feeding America, more than 720,000 Mississippians are food insecure, meaning people don't have access to healthy food. That number has increased by 75% since 2018, and much of that is caused by the coronavirus. Will Davis, assistant professor at Mississippi State University, says people who were previously able to afford healthy meals may have lost their jobs or a significant portion of their income. So you are having a lot of people who are becoming food insecure who maybe weren't before. And so they're not signed up for a lot of these federal assistance programs that are meant to kind of buffer against food insecurity. A lot of people that work in service-related fields are becoming food insecure at an alarming rate. And then also, you know, the people who are already food insecure and already disadvantaged, it's just getting worse. The latest statistics show that Mississippi's July unemployment rates reached 11.5 percent, almost double the rate from last year. And as Rosie Ryan nears the front of the line to pick up her meals for the week, the out-of-work mother says she's thankful for programs like these. If it wasn't for these food pantry giveaways like they're doing, it would be rough. Yeah, it would be rough. Experts say even after the state recovers from the economic impact of the coronavirus, there could be lasting effects where many Mississippians may still struggle to feed their families. Kobe Vance, MPB News. Coming up, a virtual conference aims to equip caregivers with the tools to manage Alzheimer's. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. The TARDIS is our little free library here in Miles. It's the TARDIS from the Doctor Who series. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Surprisingly, for a small town in Mississippi, there are a lot of folks who know exactly what it is. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Approximately five and a half million Americans face the daily challenges of Alzheimer's, including over 57,000 Mississippians. Caregivers and family members of those living with the disease require unique tools and strategies to navigate each day. To help, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America is hosting a free virtual Alzheimer's educational conference for Mississippi residents tomorrow. Charles Fuschillo with the AFA says this unique conference will arm care givers with the local resources they need to provide the best quality care for their loved ones and maintain their own health. You know, prior to the pandemic, it's the uh, physical and emotional stress and the task of great initiative of of avoiding caregiver burnout during the pandemic when we have stay-at-home orders and isolation. It's the it's heightened the emotional and physical stress that a caregiver is going through. Is there a well, I think there is an inherent sadness or even grief when you're caring with a caring for a loved one because in a sense they're going away. Absolutely. Look, these this is individuals whether it's your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle, these are people you've known all your life and their memory is 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 being lessened every single day and they're forgetting things. They're forgetting who you are. And it's so overwhelming to know somebody your entire life. And yet they may not know you anymore. Now, this conference, this virtual conference is, uh, well, for for Mississippians, it's an opportunity to learn some skills and and some coping skills during this pandemic while you're caring for someone with Alzheimer's. Is that the purpose? Yeah, it is the purpose. We started this initiative, Educating America Tour, about four years ago. And we traveled throughout the entire country each year to provide information about Alzheimer's disease, brain health and wellness, dementia caregiving, and let individuals know they can turn to AFA for guidance, counseling, and support. So we're excited to be um, virtually in Mississippi on September 15th from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. to hold this conference. And individuals can register through our website, which is ALZ fdn.org or call our office at 866-232-8484. 
There are three major sessions during this. Can you tell us? We'll, we'll go through each one. The first is unraveling Alzheimer's disease. Sure, but prior to that, we're, we're so happy that Dr. Oz will be a guest speaker uh, to kick off the conference, and he's going to share his own personal story that he's living through right now as a caregiver for his mom, Suna, who has Alzheimer's disease, and he's going to share some of his strategies and offer tips for healthy aging. And right after that, a member of our medical advisory board here at AFA, Dr. George Perry, he's going to provide an update of Alzheimer's research and clinical trials and what to expect on the horizon. And then we're going to go transfer it right into a session on creating your caregiver support team in the times of COVID-19. What are the obstacles or, or further challenges because of the pandemic? Living in isolation. It's one of the things we never advocate for anybody, not just individuals living with Alzheimer's or any related dementia. Um, it's a tremendous, you know, obstacle. The stay-at-home orders, no visitors in care settings. You know, we encourage socialization. That's one of the reasons why we at the Alzheimer's Foundation of America have translated, put all our programs virtual now. So seven days a week, individuals through our social media can participate in virtual programs. It's so critically important that a caregiver tries best at their best that they can maintain the schedule of the one they're caring for and keep the socialization as active as possible. How important is a schedule for someone with Alzheimer's? So critically important. The routine of getting up at a certain hour, having your meals during the day, participating in social activities to the best you can, even in the pandemic when individuals are staying home, to get on a phone to talk to somebody, FaceTime, send an email, a text message, or even have somebody come to your window of your house or apartment or wherever you're living just to say hello is so critically important. But the schedule of maintaining normalcy is something we advocate. Do people with uh, patients with me- Alzheimer's take medications? Are there things they take to help slow the process? So there hasn't really been any new medication in the last 20 years, but Aricep and Namenda, those are the two most common prescribed medications for individuals with Alzheimer's for their memory. Um, we, sub- we fund research all over the world for better treatment and a cure, and for the first time the federal government is appropriating nearly $3 billion a year now for research, so there is hope on the horizon for better treatment and a cure. Are there any advances in treatment? Every single day. Every single day, there are thousands of trials that are going on in the United States. So we never give up hope. Uh, we feel that better treatment is on the horizon, and someday there will be a cure for this terrible disease. If someone can't attend this uh, conference virtually, will it be recorded that someone could see it later? Absolutely, and we could send it to them uh, through email. But they could also call our helpline, which is the same number of our office, 866-232-8484, at any time, seven days a week, to speak to one of our social workers who are uh, are licensed social workers at a dementia specifically trained. But they could just pick up the phone and call somebody if they have any concerns about themselves or somebody that they love. What do those calls tend to be about? You know, how do I keep my loved one active and engaged while at home during COVID-19? Are there steps that I can deal with the disruptions in a person's daily routine? What do I do if I'm feeling stressed or overwhelmed? And what steps can I take to reduce the chances of the person I'm caring for being exposed to COVID? Again, tell us how people can attend the conference. So we're excited that Tuesday, September 15, 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., individuals can register for the Educating America Tour conference at alzfdn.org or call our office at 866-232-8484. Charles Fischillo is the president and CEO of the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me on. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter. And fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. 